The streets of Paris are packed with cheering crowds, all waiting to catch a glimpse of the automobile that had done the impossible. Driven all the way to France from Peking, China, more than 10,000 miles over some of the world's roughest terrain. The date was August 10th, 1907. Almost a year prior, a French newspaper called Le Matin had challenged the world's burgeoning auto industry to prove the supremacy of their cars by means of a race across Asia and Europe. Many thought it couldn't be done. After all, the automotive industry was in its infancy and cars weren't seen as reliable as horses yet. It had been just two decades since Carl Benz patented the world's first production motor vehicle and Henry Ford's Model T wouldn't debut for another year. The Chinese didn't even have a word for car yet. But thanks to some of the very first maniacs to ever fall in love with cars, it happened. And just two months after the race began, the first place finisher was parading down Champs-Élysées. This is the story of the first race in Peking, Paris. It's Champs-Élysées. God <laughs> damn it, Joe. Uh, Champs-Élysées. <laughs> Uh, Champs-Élysées. Anyway, welcome back to Pass Gas. I am your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my other hosts on the show. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, James Pumphrey. Hello. Toot toot. And Joe Weber. And I extend another hello to you too, sir. Uh, keep it juiced. Keep it juiced. Well, today we're talking about uh, the first trans, uh, not transatlantic, one of the very first motor races in <laughs> but, history. You know, it's still pretty good. It's not like they drove across the Atlantic or nothing, but, uh, you know, it's far, too. Wait, is this the race that Whoopsie Goldberg was in with a car <laughs> with Seth Green? Mouse Trap, starring uh, Nathan Lane. Um, <laughs> Loved that movie when I was a kid. Not that that has anything to do with it. I think we should just get into it. How about that? <laughs> it's all right. In January 1907... A challenge appeared on the front page of Le Matin. Uh, James, could you give, give me your best French accent here? Uh, is there anyone who will undertake to travel this summer from Paris to Peking by automobile? Whoever he is, this tough and daring man whose gallant car will have a dozen nations watching his progress, he will certainly deserve to have his name spoken as a byword in the four quarters of the earth. <laughs> Dang, yeah, so... I uh, we all know this quote already because, uh, this was, I did not realize this, but this race is part of the very first episode of Wheelhouse. Yeah. Why are race cars red? Uh, anyway, the newspaper dubbed it a stupendous challenge. A stupendous challenge. <laughs> it Le would be a stupendous challenge for any man with any car. Le no horses allowed. No horses Le allowed. No horses allowed. Le well Matin organized the race with two goals in mind. The first was publicity for the paper itself, and the second was to promote the French car industry, which had not gained the same traction as manufacturers from Italy, England, and the United States. Using the somewhat recent spread of the Telegraph across Asia, they planned to publish live dispatches from reporters traveling with the race to drum up excitement for both. Initial interest in the challenge was high, with over 40 entrants submitting their intention to participate, but uh, by the time the deposit of 2,000 francs, or about $35,000 today, was paid, what? the field was whittled down to just five. Most fervent among those were two men of completely opposite means and personality. I feel like we're going to get some protagonists in the story Ooh, now. Oh, yeah, but they're an odd couple. <laughs> <laughs> one of them's messy and one of them's neat. <laughs> On one side was Prince Scaponi Borghese, a well-known Italian diplomat, explorer, and mountain climber who had previously journeyed across Asia from Beirut to Peking, which is now known as Beijing. Mm. Upon reading the call to action in Le Motin, he immediately wrote to the newspaper that he would be participating, which helped lend credibility to the challenge. His no-nonsense demeanor was clear from the start. He quickly commissioned a car from an early auto manufacturer based out of Turin, Atala, and began uh, meticulously planning his journey. What? This is the guy. This is the, the guy who had the red car, the Atala mod. It was, uh, this had, is the guy. This, this, this is, is the, the guy. guy I was telling you about. Yeah, I believe Prince. this car had about 40 horsepower. 
The Skip Prince, on. Prince Borghese. Borghese enlisted the Russian Petroleum Company Nobel to deliver fuel deposits across the Russian Empire at no cost to him. Sponsorship, baby. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Friggin' fuel companies have been sponsoring races since the beginning. At this point, gasoline was more commonly used in dry cleaning than in cars. <laughs> so Nobel had a huge incentive to prove that it was possible to drive through Russia. Borghese also brought on his personal mechanic, a former train engineer named Atori Gizar- Gizardi. Guizardi. 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 <laughs> 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 Borghese also brought on his personal mechanic, a former train engineer named Itori Guizari, to accompany him on the trip. On the other end of the spectrum, professional driver Charles Goddard could best be described as a charming lunatic. You know, you know the type. Uh, one of those swashbuckling types, you know. Yeah, probably I wears a, like a like a, a leather bracelet. Mm-hmm. Like a bracer. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's got like a the heartogram tattoo. Yeah. He hangs out with Bam all the time. Yeah, he's got <laughs> Chelsea boots for sure. <laughs> he's got to be so sexy, we don't care that he's a stick in the mud. <laughs> we still want him. Yeah. We still want him on our team. We still want him <laughs> at our dinner table. You know what I mean? Uh, so on the other end of the spectrum uh, from the sexy Italian Prince Borghese. The, on the other side of the spectrum was sexy professional driver Charles Goddard, who could best be described as a charming lunatic. When the challenge was announced, Goddard was riding motorcycles in a small Parisian stunt show called Le Wall of Death. <laughs> However, he managed to secure a spot driving for the Belgian company Metallurgique. Metallurgique. I think it's metallurgic. just metallurgic. <laughs> metallurgic? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <Metallurgique>. <laughs> he had managed to secure a spot driving for the Belgian company <laughs> Metallurgique in the Peking to Paris raid, as it was being called at this point. Le Matin had decided to reverse the order of the race to avoid China's rainy season. While the other entrants were worried about the hazards of off-roading over countless mountain ranges through the Great Wall of China, into the Gobi Desert, across Siberia, and down through mainland Europe, Goddard was delighted. He simply loved driving, despite not knowing a lick about how cars actually worked. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Cole Trickle, Days of Thunder, <laughs> loosely based on Goddard. Unfortunately for him, metallurgique or <laughs> metallurgique. Me- metallurgique got cold feet about the cost of shipping a car and driving to China. Goddard was disappointed, but not deterred and traveled to Amsterdam to convince a Dutch company called Spiker that sponsoring an entry in the raid would more than pay for itself in publicity. That's awesome. I didn't know that Spiker had been around for that long. Um, I uh, I assume Spiker is an energy drink. <laughs> yeah. Drink some Spiker. It'll give you spines. It's made out of <laughs> heroin. It, it's 1907. Drink Spiker Energy. It's made out of cocaine. It's got radium. Now with radium. Now with 20% more radium. I just imagine that there's a lot of pulp from the ground up CN enemies that they're using in the formula. What if there's just like ambiguous pulp that you don't, they don't ever say what fruit is from? Just pulp. Spiker's got everything you need to be healthy. Hooves, <laughs> meat fats, cocaine, mercury, and radium. Spiker was interested, but the company was nearly broke. To make matters worse, mere weeks after Le Matin published the challenge, company co-founder Hendrik Spiker, <laughs> spelt different, and a British banker whom, it must be a coincidence, and a British banker <laughs> whom he had convinced to lend the company funds were both killed in a steamship accident while traveling from oh England God. to Holland. It's crazy. But Henrik's older brother, Jacobus, liked Goddard's passion and agreed to give Goddard... Hey, don't make fun of him. His brother just died. Come on, guys. I know. Yeah, his, his name is, is hilarious. His, his name is Jacobus. <laughs> Jacobus. Um, and, agree, and Jacobus agreed to give Goddard a car and lend him the entry fee. 
He's probably like, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you can have a car. <laughs> hey, man, I know your brother just died, but can I get yeah. that entry fee real quick? Yeah. Okay, cool, man. Yeah, really sorry taste about this. Um, taste this. Yeah. Taste this. Taste this. Taste this. Yeah, okay. it's a new formula for Spiker. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's like, hey, it's got more gunpowder in it. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of, ooh. What's Did that pulp I'm tasting? Yeah, Did what's that not, pulp? Don't That's, worry about the pulp. Did you shoot your good. pants? Did you shoot I, your pants? I have, am I gonna shoot <laughs> my pants? Did it? Did that drink just make you shoot <laughs> your pants? Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's still doing it. Yep, it's, it's still going. It's still doing it. Oh, God. Back to oh the God. board, fellas. It's it smells good. Good smelling diarrhea is a side oh, effect. God. Really <laughs> conflicted on this product. Anyway, thank you for the entry fee. I'll, I'll I gotta go home. Uh, though he told Godard that he would not pay for anything else, Godard promptly sold every spare part that came on the Spiker to pay for his passage to China. Uh, of the other three entries, so this guy was just like broke, broke. Yeah, he wanted to race. Oh, man. you broke, broke. Oh, you broke. He was a he was a stunt. He was a motorcycle stuntman in stuntman stuntman in Paris, like in 1907. Yeah, he's probably not making a ton of money. Like he's not the great Godard. He's just a guy in like a motorcycle stunt. Sorry, ensemble. Yeah, he's like the guy at, at Universal Studios that does the Waterworld show ten times a day and risks his life for like fifty bucks a pop. China's foreign council, known as the Waiwapu, didn't want it to happen. China was just six years removed from the end of the Boxer Rebellion, in which an anti-imperial Chinese faction tried to eject European trade powers from the country. The European powers eventually won through sheer military force, but the Waiwapu's leader remained suspicious of the West. He assumed that the raid was a cover for European spies to sow discord in the Chinese mainland, or possibly a test for a land invasion from the West via automobile. I think those are legitimate concerns. Pretty reasonable yeah. concerns, I will agree. And as a result, the Chinese government's position was to be as unhelpful as possible to these chichos, the term they invented for cars that roughly translates to oil chariots. Dude, we should start calling cars chichos. Chichos. Yeah, my chicho. Got the new chicho outside. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but because of the treaty that ended the Boxer Rebellion, the Waiwapu did not have the power to officially reject the racers. Instead, they did everything they could to make le maton, or drivers cancel the raid themselves. And guess what, fellas? It almost worked. The raid was nearly canceled twice due to the Chinese government's efforts, which included a refusal to grant the drivers passports into Mongolia. The first time was before the majority of the drivers had left Europe. The second was mere days before the raid's official start. Maybe they shouldn't have called it a raid. Yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> branding is so important in life. Um, if you call they it a raid... They probably should have like, explained cars to Chinese people too before. It's like they're trying to bring these huge machines into their country and do a raid with them. Like, I wouldn't let those people in. I don't know. They want to come do an oil chariot raid. <laughs> Ooh, is that cool? I, what? No. <laughs> I mean, if they wanted an easier time, they should have called. Yeah, not a raid, but like a um, Chicho. Uh, fun run. Fun run. A celebration of the automobile, perhaps. Something cruise. that's a little more like cruise, something a little more uh, uh, um, benign, you know? A toys for tots. <laughs> toys for tots never raises any suspicion. So anyway, George Cormier in particular worried about the driver's safety without passports. Uh, yeah. And also saw business opportunity. These were the only cars in all of China. If the race was canceled, they could be sold for a tidy profit. Hey, man, cut your losses, but make that money back. But... Borghese and Goddard wouldn't hear of it. Both drivers insisted they would press forward with the raid even if no one else did, even if the government didn't issue them passports. Cormier and the Waiwapu both eventually caved to the pressure, and the race was on. The raid launched on June 10th, 1907 with a lavish send-off from Peking. The rainy season had come early, muddying up the streets, but it wouldn't stop the festivities. Accompanied by fireworks and a military band, the cars roared out of the French ministry compound into the streets, crowded with Chinese citizens. 
Led by Cormier, the parade of cars made their way to the city wall and out the enormous gate of virtue triumphant into the surrounding plains. The race was on. Conditions were immediately terrible. Despite <laughs> Lamothon's attempts to avoid the bad weather, the early rain made the drive into the Jundu Mountains nearly impassable. All the teams were forced to hire porters to drag and carry their cars through narrow river gorges and up into the dizzying heights of the mountain range. So already they're not driving. <laughs> <laughs> this meant that each car had to be as light as possible. So all the drivers had to dump many of the extra supplies they carried, except Borghese, who had the body of his heavy Atala mod removed and carried separately by an extra team right. of porters. You got that cash. Why not? Yeah, dude, spend it. Goddard was sad to lose his food and drink reserves, especially that sweet, sweet spiker energy drink, particularly <laughs> a free case of champagne he was gifted at the starting line. Why would you bring that with you? I mean, why, why not wait till the end? Anyway, he was so broke that in order to pay for his accommodations, food and fuel, as well as the dog he adopted from a <laughs> Peking market, this dude's bringing champagne and a dog? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> doesn't seem like he's great at managing money. I'm just going to say. He that. really doesn't. No. He, uh, he scammed 5,000 francs out of the Dutch minister in Peking by falsifying a letter of credit from the owner of Spiker. So he's just, he's scamming it up. He's racing. Scam like, you know what? This might be one of the first, like, motor races ever. Uh, but the, the cliches of motor yeah. drivers are already here you got the rich guy who just pays for everything yeah. and you got a guy like goddard who's just faking his way through it he's like scamming the, people the, along the he's way like the smoky eunuch character who's kind of a yeah. grifter he's he's for definitely sure. played by a young harrison ford <laughs> but like cgi <laughs> yeah. harrison ford or the kid from uh uh, uh solo that guy did a great job but anyway it's just amazing that the 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 cliche racer tropes are already here in like the first race ever i'm just amazed by that anyway including that debt as well as the money that he had borrowed from jacobus uh spiker and the la Martin reporter jean tutais uh goddard was in the hole fifteen thousand four hundred francs which is over two hundred fifty thousand dollars today and on top of that his fuel was only paid for through the russian border so he had to still had a lot of things to figure out even with the reduced weight, the mountains outside Peking were dangerous for porters and drivers alike. Each car had to be dragged over the tops of boulders, risking damage to their primitive chassis. And then once they peaked each boulder, more porters had to pull on the car from behind, or both of the car and the drivers would crash down the other side. Oh my god. Wait, so the drivers are just in the car and yeah. pulled? <laughs> Why don't you help? <laughs> <sighs> Other areas of the path were too narrow, so the porters were forced to clear the way with pickaxes. Oh, my God. There's also the language barrier to contend with, and most of the workers ended up becoming opium addicts. In other words, <laughs> it was a slow-going journey. Come on, man. What a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> this is not even the first leg of it. I'm already disappointed with these guys. Hey guys, before we get into it, I just want to give a quick thank you to our sponsor this week, Hawthorne. You know, I've been thinking about making some changes lately to my personal routine. I want to improve my self care. You know what I'm saying? Problem was I had no idea where to start. Then I found Hawthorne. Hawthorne is a premium tailored personal care brand that's making it easy for guys to feel and smell their best. You start with a quiz. They ask you things like, what's your favorite drink? How do you like to spend a night out? Do you smoke, etc." Then they take all these answers, feed it into their algorithm, and Hawthorne finds correct products for you. It's actually pretty easy. It's pretty fun. Super quick. Took like five minutes. Products I got, I talk about every week, the facial lotion and skin lotion. I love this stuff. Mine's an aloe based. I did not know how dry I was. Now I'm not dry. <laughs> If you want to upgrade your self-care routine, Hawthorne is a fun and convenient way to do it. It's got super high quality products tailored specifically to your needs. Makes a great gift too. Hawthorne even takes the risk out of it by giving you free shipping on your order and returns, okay? It's awesome. And if you don't like their products, they'll even retailer them based on your feedback. So do what I did. Take Hawthorne's quiz today. Get started on your own personalized self-care routine by going to hawthorne.co and use promo code GAS to get 10% off your first purchase. That's H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot C-O, promo code GAS. Hawthorne.co, promo code GAS. Thank you very much, Hawthorne. 
August Pons in the three-wheel Cantal had especially bad uh, problems. His car was the easiest to lift, but is also terribly balanced. A passenger seat above the front two front two wheels, so it's not even. Oh my goodness! The, <laughs> the, a passenger seat above the front two wheels made the car extremely front heavy. Uh, so Pons struggled to get traction with his single back wheel. It's just a spinning back there. <laughs> And even when he was able to drive it, the back wheel would bounce into ruts left by ox-driven wagons, meaning the Contal could barely steer through the narrow mountain passes. Oh, my God. I'm having a real hard time of it. <laughs> but after several days of struggle, all five cars eventually made it over the mountains, through the Great Wall, and into Mongolia, with Prince Borghese in the lead. Just before they entered the Gobi Desert, the five teams shared a campsite along with the reporters who traveled in the raid. Dutali of Limartin. <laughs> Dutali of Limartin in Godard's car and the Italian journalists Luigi Barzini and Borghese with Borghese and Edgardo Longoni with Comier. It would end up being the last time that the group was in one place. Pawn set out first the next morning because he had been constantly falling behind the caravan. The other drivers followed, hoping that if Pons encountered more trouble, they could help him without slowing themselves. First was Comier and Collignon in the De Dion's, followed by Godard in his Spiker, then finally Borghese in the powerful Atala. To stay on track, the drivers followed a route laid out by telegraph poles between their campsite and the next stop a remote telegraph station where Le Matin had planned a fuel drop. Pons indeed ran into more car trouble, running out of gas well before the refueling point. What happened next is a point of contention. Pons had already fallen behind all three French drivers when he broke down, so Borghese, at the back of the pack, was in a position to know that Pons was stuck. However, when Borghese caught up with Godard that same day, he claimed that Pons was fine. <laughs> was it a misunderstanding? Or was it sabotage? Either way, Pons never reached the telegraph station that night. According to the caravan agreement, Borghese should have retraced their route to rescue Pons and Foucault because he had the fastest car. Instead, Borghese told the others he would continue toward Paris. When pressed, he suggested that Pons would be fine because the drivers had not yet left inhabited land. The other drivers, when faced with returning to find Pons or letting Borghese get a day ahead in the raid, regretfully decided to push on as well. With guilty consciences, Godard and Dutali sent riders on horseback to find the Contal. But when they found him, he was a fat skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, like, before... <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, it's like, I know we made this like packed, but like... God. Nah. And it's not like you're going that fast anyway. Like, why not just take the time? Like, you spent days carrying your cars over these mountains. Like, you can afford to burn some more time going to get the, the other dude, you know? Right. The race is a year long. Yeah. Go come on, man. Come on, go. man. Come on, man. Before they could continue, the drivers faced another problem. The fuel drop had arrived with leaky tanks. Oh, so no. So much of the gas had evaporated. Oof. With Pons absent, Borghese and the two De Dion drivers all took what amounted to their full share. But Godard did not want to force Pons from the raid. He decided to take less gas and leave some behind in case Pons eventually made it to the station. Godard is the gaz. I, I am rooting for Godard here. Yeah. yeah. Because he's like a scallywag, but he's got honor. Yeah. Yeah, Borghese just like immediately gave up all his integrity. Like, I do not bye. care about. I'm going to win. <laughs> the lone wolf does not care about the uh, weak sheep. You had twice the amount of porters that we did. You're not a lone wolf. Uh, <laughs> even the lone wolf needs a porter or two. <laughs> <laughs> This noble decision left the spiker without enough gas to make it through the desert. Godard wired to the next telegraph station where a larger fuel supply was waiting and asked the operator to send out a camel loaded with gas tanks to meet him. Wow. Godard reasoned that he could borrow enough fuel from the De Dion's in order to reach the camel driver. But his level of worry was clear to Dutali's later 
in the day when Godard realized he forgot his dog oh back at the God. telegraph station. Oh, no. But refused to return to Retriever. <laughs> yeah, oh. it's just a dog. It's 1907. It's just a dog. It's just a dog. I think the dog is better off, honestly, not being on this, <laughs> this oh, journey. I forgot my freaking dog. If the dog had stayed with them, there's a... a Above good chance it would be eaten. Yeah, I was about to say that. Yeah, good chance it would uh, be be find its way into a can of Spiker. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As the others made their way across the Gobi, Pons and Foucault remained stuck. The riders sent by Godard and Dutouli never reached him. The two Frenchmen spent several days stranded at the edge of the desert, nearly died of exposure before stumbling across a tribe of Mongolian nomads who nursed them back to health. After they were eventually rescued by a team from Les Montines, Pons claimed he was betrayed by the other drivers. That tricked me. His cantal was left to rust in the Mongolian desert. Dang. Meanwhile, Godard faced his own problems. He managed to beg some gas from Cormier and Collignon, but they claimed to be low themselves and didn't give Godard enough to make it through the desert. Uh, uh sorry, we uh, barely have enough gas for ourselves. Yes, yes, we barely have enough gas for us then. Sorry, Godard. <laughs> when he eventually ran out, he tried to ask the Didion drivers for help a second time, but they rumbled past him without stopping. So much for that ag agreement. Huh? I was about to yeah. say, I think this really shows like Au revoir, monsieur. In in these dire situations, like they are like you know, the lack of forethought that went into this. They're like, yeah, of course, we'll just have an agreement. We'll help each other to the to Russia. But then, like, when things start getting actually hard and you have to start making these really hard decisions, like, certain people are going to, like, be dicks, you know? Yeah. Straight up. Well put. Straight up. That left Guitard and Dutali stuck in the middle of the Gobi Desert as temperatures reached 116 degrees. Ugh. Comier and Borghese both later claimed to have passed the camel driver with Godard's requested fuel, but that supply never made it to the spiker. Instead, Godard and Dutali huddled in the shade of their vehicle for nearly two days, subsisting on dry cubes of condensed soup and drinking oily water from the spiker's radiator. Oh my god. Oh. Dang, our boys almost died. Wow. Yeah, dude. Dry cubes of condensed soup sounds really good, though. Not Dry lie. cubes of condensed soup. In the midst of their ordeal, they were discovered by a lone woman on camelback who tried and failed to tow the car with her mount. Later that night, they were passed by a caravan of merchants who left them for dead. With their emergency supplies completely gone and Du Tali battling a case of dysentery he had picked up in China, a strangely cheerful Godard proclaimed he was going prospecting and wandered off into the desert. <laughs> What? What? <laughs> uh, two hours later, he miraculously returned. Of course he did, you dard. Uh, <laughs> and he was riding on horseback with a troop of Kungus tribesmen. Hell yeah. Via pantomime sign language, Godard managed to negotiate for the tribesmen to ride ahead and retrieve the spiker's fuel deposit, plus lend the Frenchman two camels to start towing them towards the telegraph station. 44 hours after breaking down, Godard was back in the race. Yeah. Hell yeah, our boy, that's dude. A, that's such a come up. It almost makes me seem that, it makes it seem that they were just like on the edge of like a mountain or something, and there was just like a tribe right over the mountain, and they never thought to like <laughs> look mm -hmm. over. <laughs> Meanwhile, that was really beautiful, Joe. It was really well put. <laughs> a lot of mountains in the desert. <laughs> Meanwhile, Prince Borghese was finally running into his own trouble. Finally. After making it through the Gobi, the Italia was the first entry to cross into Russia where the route promptly ran into a large lake. Le Matin had given the drivers permission to put their cars aboard a ferry to cross the lake, but Borghese was determined to drive as far as he could. Attempting to circumnavigate the lake forced the prince, his mechanic Guizardi, and the reporter Barzini to cross a series of wooden bridges that had fallen into disrepair. They developed a foolproof technique to get across the rickety bridges. Drive as fast as possible. <laughs> <laughs> this worked great until it very spectacularly didn't. Halfway around the lake, one of the bridges finally gave way and sent the car tumbling backwards into the Ooh. river below. 
Local police officer who had been traveling alongside the party immediately ran for help and then immediately a puked. <laughs> he, he puked. It was so gross. Assuming that the three Italians were dead. But amid the disaster, luck was still on the prince's side. They landed on a duck, and the <laughs> duck took off and flew them all the way to Paris, and they won. The end. Wow. Wow. Amazing story. <laughs> wow. What's <Yeah>. up? <laughs> Follow me on Instagram. JK, it's not the end. Uh, he and his companions escaped the wreck with just bumps and bruises. Some nearby rare workers helped... Guizardi repair the Italia and they are back on the road within three hours. Borghese realized that the bridges were too dangerous to cross and instead came up with an even more dangerous tactic. They would simply drive along the Trans-Siberian Railway instead, <laughs> and that meant dodging the trains running along the same single rail, which quickly proved to be very treacherous. After one very narrow escape from an oncoming freighter, the prince called in some new favors and had his Atala added to the rail schedule as its own train line so they could avoid more close calls. That's some prince stuff right there. That is some prince stuff. It was in this way that Borghese made it all the way to Moscow while Goddard was still stuck in the Gobi Desert. And meanwhile, Cormier and Collignon kept going at a more modest pace and reached the European border in Russia. After blowing past Goddard and Dutalis in the desert, Cormier later described his part of the journey as fairly luxurious. The De Dion's had a hefty supply of traveling food and were welcomed with lavish parties being thrown by the racing delegations in almost every town in Russia. Sounds pretty, pretty cool. fun. Perhaps part of the luxury was knowing that he was now quite far ahead of Goddard and quite far behind Borghese, so there's no need to rush. If so, that sense of complacency betrayed him because Godard, after nearly dying in the desert, somehow drove for 24 hours straight to catch up with the De Dion's oh in Tomsk, Russia. Ha ha! It is I, Godard! <laughs> but you were dying in the desert. But I did not die! I am friends with the tribesmen! <laughs> We got a camel to drink a bunch of gas and walk out <laughs> to the desert and meet you, then throw up all over your car. <laughs> ha ha! <laughs> Never <laughs> underestimate Gadad! <laughs> <laughs> He's got a sword now. He's wearing yeah, a mask. He yeah, dude. Godard. From rules! For, from there, Cormier, Collignon, and Gadard. Let's go! <laughs> agreed to resume. It is me, Gadard! Let's go! Through Siberia, but Godard ha -ha! ran into car troubles. To keep the spiker running, he successfully plugged a hole in his rear axle with raw bacon. <laughs> uh, despite the ingenious and delicious quick fix, he was eventually unable to continue after the caravan tried to fjord a river and his magneto got wet. Nobody wants a wet magneto. Uh, wait, did you say fjord? Fjord a river? Fjord a river, yeah. Say it, Joe. <laughs> Say it. I see your face. <laughs> a, fjord, a fjord is a is a body of water, but you try and ford a river. What if you try to ford a fjord? Yeah, you can ford a fjord. Can you afford a ford to ford the a fjord? <laughs> <laughs> you can afford a ford to fjord the ford. <laughs> ah, you said it. <laughs> anyway, nobody wants that wet magneto. Goddard. Thinking quickly, Goddard sent a telegram to Jacob as Spiker. Telegram is like an, like an AIM or a BBM. From yeah. It's like a two-way. Yeah, like you like, ever been on your two-way and you sent like an Excel sheet to your friend? Basically the same thing. <laughs> Goddard sent a telegram to Jacob as Spiker requesting a mechanic and some spare parts. Spiker, who had, con who had previously concluded that Goddard was Hold a on, con I have man. Something really important. I have something really important. I have 401,000 Instagram followers now. Nice. So I need a really good 401k joke. Uh um <laughs> Do you have something about how you should probably start your 401k? Yeah, guys, start your 401k. Oh well, let's just go back to the dumb podcast. I want to thank our sponsor this week, BetterHelp. What interferes with your happiness? Is something preventing you from achieving your goals? Well, guess what? BetterHelp 
will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can connect in a safe and private online environment. It's super convenient and you can start communicating with that therapist in under 24 hours. It's not self-help, it's professional counseling. That's right. Send a message to your counselor anytime. You get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So helpful right now. All without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. That's super convenient. It's more affordable than traditional online counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp is available for clients worldwide. And there's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. BetterHelp has licensed professional counselors who are specialized in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBTQ matters, grief, and self-esteem. And of course, anything you share with them is confidential. It's very convenient. BetterHelp is professional, affordable, and you can check out testimonials posted daily on their site. But just as a disclaimer, BetterHelp is not a crisis line, okay? In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states, growing every day. I want you to start living a happier life today. And as a listener of Past Gas, you get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash past gas. That's better H E L P dot com slash past gas. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H E L P dot com slash past gas. Thank you very much, BetterHelp, for sponsoring this episode. So anyway, Spiker had concluded that Goddard was a con man and unlikely to even start the race, uh, but was back on board to help because of the huge publicity the raid was bringing his company. European audiences were hanging on to each and every dispatch of oh, the man, journey. Can you imagine, dude, like, that's that's right. the only so thing going sending, on at the time. Yeah, they're sending yeah. telegraphs back and they're like, they're stuck in the desert. It's like, oh, no. It's like, he went and befriended the tribesmen with pantomime. He drove 24 <laughs> hours straight. Yeah, he's back. He caught up to the Denions. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was like. Anyway, uh, yeah, Spiker sent a young mechanic from the Spiker factory and a crate of spare parts along the Trans-Siberian Railroad to go and meet Godard. But Godard was not content to wait around. He put his car on a train to the nearest university hundreds of kilometers away where he found an engineering professor who agreed to fix the Magneto. And uh. once the repairs were completed, Godard, remember, Godard doesn't really know how cars work. <laughs> uh, Godard returned to- What are you returned, talking about? I got the bad guy from the X-Men wet. <laughs> uh, Godard returned via Who's train to, say to the spot if he's really a bad guy huh? where his car had broken down and raced uh, once again to catch up with Cormier picking up the spiker mechanic and his extra parts along the way I mean this must have taken like this whole thing that I just read probably yeah. took like a week oh yeah. at least or like a few days because like he's getting on a train he's going hundreds of kilometers trains aren't very fast a Especially month. back then. I bet it took a month. A month? Mm -hmm. That would be pretty crazy. He also had to like contact this professor, like find the yeah. professor, contact the professor, agree to meet him hundreds of miles away, set yeah. up his car to put on this train. Like, right. It took so long back then. Dude, and he definitely had like a love affair in there. Oh, there's definitely like a very steamy... Yeah. Um, yeah, extramarital. Well, no, he's he not had married. Kids, he raised those kids up. Tonight I am yours, but do not fall in love. For <laughs> I, Goddard, belong to the raid. Over the next thirty-five hundred miles, Goddard was delayed when he found a baby who what? had fallen <laughs> off the back of an ox cart, which he eventually was forced to deposit at a local church after failing to find the mother. What I bet hell? he was definitely planning on bringing that baby with him for a, for a minute. He's like, you know what? Oh, I kind of this like baby. this little baby. How funny would it be if I showed up in Paris with a baby? <laughs> <laughs> People are all, get down. Why do you have a baby? People I, would laugh so hard for so long. <laughs> and like me, like me, that like I would be the funniest guy to yeah. be a, have a baby. Sure. Yeah, Borghese won, but he, does he have a baby? <laughs> oh, sorry, I had to make a child <laughs> by myself. 
Uh, yeah, he, he was also briefly transported by a Russian countess who demanded passage in his car, but left her in a field after she got <laughs> car sick on him. <laughs> Au revoir! <laughs> this could be a trilogy. Oh, Dude, for this sure. This is definitely cool. a Netflix original series. But Godard drove day and night, including a final stretch of 29 hours straight to catch up with the De Dion's. He found them in Kazan, Russia, two weeks after separating near Tomsk. The same stretch took Borghese three weeks to cover, and it took Cormier nearly five. So Goddard's definitely the best driver, I yeah, think. he's a freaking ace. He's a beast. This guy's a beast. He's going he's beast, beast mode. Beast. He's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but that grueling journey wasn't even the greatest trouble Goddard faced, though he didn't know it yet. When he was dashing across Russia... A court back in Amsterdam sentenced him to 18 months in prison for frauding the Dutch minister in Peking. That credit scam caught up with him. Whoops. Prince Borghese's lead continued to lengthen even though he ran into Wait, his he first... Wait, in jail for how long? No, he just had like a warrant out. Yeah, uh. in Amsterdam. He sent, so when, when he gets back to, to Holland, he's, uh, he's going, to, going to jail for 18 months. <laughs> I <laughs> love this guy, man. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty good. As soon as I finish the raid, I promise I will go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> Prince Borghese's lead continued to lengthen even though he ran into his first serious car trouble. While in western Russia, the Atala's foot brake caused the floorboards to catch fire. Oh my god. Flames crawled within inches of a spare gas tank before the journalist Barzini managed to put it out with the prince's fur coat. <laughs> Why are you bringing a fur coat with you? Cat catastrophe was averted, but the Atala had to make the rest of the trip with only a handbrake. Oh my god, can you imagine? That said, the prince probably could have won the raid with no brakes. Because of Goddard's breakdown and Cormier's, Cormier's slow pace, excuse me, after rip Moscow, the Atala was so far ahead that Borghese detoured 700 kilometers out of the way to be celebrated by the Tsar's government in St. Petersburg. <laughs> so he's chilling with those Tsars. I wonder what the average speed for these car, or at least Borghese's car at the time was. It couldn't have been more than like I bet 20 miles 50, per hour? Yeah. Average, yeah. really low. Yeah. I mean, it's got 40 horsepower, though. Yeah. Pretty decent. How many horsepower does like a VW Beetle have? Uh, like 40. And it, it also weighs about 2,000 pounds, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's got some pretty decent speed, I would say, this Atala. The Atala and, Brin and Prince Borghese arrived in Paris on August 10th, just two months after uh, departing on the journey that the other drivers speculated would take them through New Year's, if it was even possible at all. So we're this whole time, we're thinking, like, man, this probably took, like, a year. It took yeah. two months. That's crazy. His bet on maximizing engine power rather than minimizing vehicle weight had clearly paid off, and the French welcomed More him. More power, like baby! <laughs> <laughs> there it is. And the French welcomed him like a conquering hero, even though he was the raid's only Italian driver. After meeting again in Kazan, Goddard and Cormier decided to forget any bad blood from earlier in the race and caravan the rest of the way to Paris. All parties later said that the 265 miles from Kazan to Nizhny Novgorod, Niz from oh my god, from Kazan <laughs> to Nizhny Novgorod <laughs> was the worst section of terrain they had faced. But after making it through, it was clear sailing to Moscow and the paved roads of Western Europe until Godard was arrested as soon as they crossed into German territory. Oh my god, let him finish it. The arrest was organized <laughs> by <laughs> Ah Le Martin. No who'd been minimizing the progress of the Dutch-made spiker in order to make the De Dion's look better in comparison. Ugh. It's slimy. The raid's organizers worried that Godard would decide to set off on his own and easily beat the two De Dion's to Paris because the spiker's advantage in power. Aren't they going to learn? He doesn't think like they do. He's a stand-up <laughs> guy. What a slippery, what a slippery, slimy snails these guys are. The French cars finishing last would have been an embarrassment to their automotive industry, particularly if the entry was driven by the boastful Godard. So, they had him arrested. But, I mean, Borghese has already won it in an Italian-made car. Uh, so, Well, they can't have it finished last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Cormier and Collignon regretfully moved on without Godard. Yeah, right. 
The Spiker entry kept pace with them using a replacement driver who Jacobus Spiker had brought to the German border with the knowledge that Godard might face legal trouble. Just a few miles from Paris, Godard caught back up with the caravan at their final breakfast before completing the raid. He made a last desperate attempt to get behind the wheel of the Spiker and drive to the finish line, but he was pulled from the car by local police. Man. An emotional Dutali volunteered to drive the rest of the race, even though he didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> he told Godard, one of us, one of us has better do it. If it can't be you, it will have to be me. I'll take our end. Godard's response, like hell you will. I'm not going to have you sugar up that old lady. What the <laughs> hell do you think you are? A driver? Ha 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 ha. Ha 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 I got my bang stick. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> you are foolish if you think you can use your hands and feet at the same time like me. <laughs> Comier, Collignon, and the Spikers replacement driver were welcomed to Paris with much celebration, just as Borghese was. Godard didn't get to finish, but the Spiker took second place despite Le Martin's interference, and Godard somehow wormed his way out of his 18-month fraud <laughs> sentence. Of course he did. Six months after the conclusion of the Peking to Paris raid, he was on the starting line for a race around the world from New York to Paris via Japan. What is we have to do that? Yeah, that's Paris cool. gas. Well, it may not be well remembered today. Peking to Paris was a triumph for the automotive industry. By the end of the journey, Prince Borghese estimated the drivers had driven nearly sixteen thousand miles, and apart from wow. Godard's wet starter, not a single car had any major mechanical failures. Uh, the massive publicity that the raid generated also helped the European public accept cars into their lives once the next wave of companies like Fiat and Ford made them more affordable. But more than anything, it helped prove that the automobile, the horselage carriage, the chicho, the oil chariot, chariot really can go anywhere as long as the driver is crazy enough to take it there. That's what I'm talking about, maybe. And if I, I remember do, correctly, the, the winning margin was only by about 60 minutes. Borghese was able to beat the De Dion's by 60 minutes. This really makes me want to do the gambler. I would, yeah. as someone who did the gambler in November, I would wait and do the one in the summer because Oregon in the summer is beautiful and Oregon in the winter, very <laughs> cold and very wet. <laughs> I kind of like the misery of it though. That's yeah, what, that's what's attractive to me. Okay. So maybe Joe and I will get some other donut staff members yeah. out there. If James wants to take this one on, dude, Joe, me, Job, mm -hmm. I think would definitely enjoy that. Yeah. I'm just saying you're going to have a lot more fun in the summer. I'm just saying I, I'm a glutton for punishment. And it's, I'll, not, I'll a, it's not fun. You can't even do the race because like all the trails are closed and stuff. It's like, ah, not, fair enough. like I think maybe they don't even do it in the winter anymore. No, they just did it. I, I saw people driving through the river. Yeah. Uh, it's a different vibe. It sounds like the summer one is fun. Yeah. The, I, the winter I, I one is. I agree is, with you, Nolan. I'm I'm kind of a mud cuck. I <laughs> would love to get out there and and you know get stuck and have to like dig our way out and go through a little bit of trials. I but think you can really do fun. that in the summer, and then it's like fun versus <laughs> like the winter where it just like you like and the end point is camping. So then you're just camping in the rain. That's a fair point. <laughs> That's a fair dark. point. Okay. Like it's just anyway. Like you're miserable for almost 48 hours. Okay. I I mean I do. I've been I, miserable I, for like 10 months this year. I don't care. <laughs> <I'm> more misery. <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you again. Thanks again for listening. Uh, I just like to acknowledge our source for this episode: Mad Motorists, the Great Peking Perry Race of 07 by Alan Andrews. Also want to give a big shout out to Greg Nix, our writer and researcher for this episode, and also Bridget, always our producer and editor. Absolutely. With, so without further ado, bye. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for thanks for listening or watching Past Gas. We really appreciate it. This is like one of our favorite things to do. Follow the boys at Joe G. Weber, at James Pumphrey, at Nolan J. Sykes on all social media. If you want to know more of our thoughts on mundane bull <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for listening. Be kind.
I love you. Keep it juiced. See you next time.